And, and perhaps, Jimmy, you can help us sort of uh, scope scene. that and just set the scene in terms of what the commission has accomplished and especially the key projects, then we move on to some other questions. Sure. Actually, I want to talk a little bit, Uran's going to help me, what, what the world was like in 1989 and 90 when, when we all sat on the planning commission. And um, I think you have to realize that New York was large. It had 322 square miles, which it still has. And in a much smaller population, 7.3 million. We're now much more than that. Um, we, in terms of mobility, we had you know, about 3.3 million people coming into the city every day over just a few and the same, basically, ways to come in today. Um, and we had 300,000 trucks coming in trying to uh, bring in the goods and services uh, that we had. Our CBD was basically, remember, it's 1989. We had two CBDs basically for in Manhattan. We had Lower Manhattan and we had Midtown Manhattan. Some 760,000 people were working <coughs> in a very constrained area. We had 300,000 manufacturing jobs at that time. It was down for a million, but we still had 300,000. I'm not sure how many, Ron, you can help us with that, how many we have today. Uh, we have 2.9 million dwelling units. 
but costs were going up. Housing affordability was really an issue then. It, our costs here in the city were going up much faster than in the nation. Homelessness was an issue. Uh, many of the same issues we're confronting today. And services, services. I mean, just a miracle how New York works. Imagine, right then, New York was delivering 1.5 million gallons of water a day and countless garbage, countless other kinds of services. I mean, it was a, a really incredible machine. And so uh, there had been talk about the need to change the governance of New York City. At the time, prior to 1989, New York had a city government that was made up of something called a Board of Estimate. And the Board of Estimate were representatives from the boroughs. And some smart person went to the courts and said, hey, wait a minute. There's equal representation of every board of every borough on the Board of Estimates. That's not fair because we have 1.2 million people living in, in Manhattan. We have I don't know, half a million living in Staten Island, and they all have the same representation. Can't do this. So that Board of Estimates was declared unconstitutional, and, the com and a, a charter commission uh, 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 commission started studying the situation and came up with a new form of government. And that new that we became part of that new form of government. Well, actually, I was part of the old form <laughs> and the new form. <laughs> right. Because I was a land use person for the borough president well, that's and true. wrote a brief against the change <laughs> and then enjoyed it. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Good point. At any rate, we did have borough presence. We did have the board of estimate. We did have a small city council. Uh, and what changed, basically, was uh, the board of estimate was eliminated. The city council was grown with 51 representatives. <coughs> And the city plan and different kinds of rulings were uh, created for different functions in the city. The city the land use functions were, were vastly changed, um, and uh, the commission, the planning commission, was was made an agent of some of these changes, and moved from having seven people all appointed by the mayor to thirteen people appointed by borough presidents, the head of city council, and by the mayor. The mayor had the majority, and uh, there were new functions that we had to engage in at that time. Uh, not only were we enlarged, but there were some basic uh, mandated reports and rulings that we had to come up with. And we can all talk about that, the fair share criteria, thinking about how uh, public investments would be allocated throughout the, um, throughout the city itself, uh, a capital budget we had to look at. We had to think as well about uh, historic landmark preservation uh, designations, the ULERP process, which I hope you <coughs> master's candidates know all about ULERP. Uh, was given a time constraint before it was untimed, and a number of, of things such as that. Oh, and we uh, also regarded, and I'm not sure what's happened to this, the 197A plans uh, were meant to be reviewed by us, and, and that was interesting because of the curious uh, legal position they had. Well, this was the commission. Uh, we had a retreat. This was taken, the picture taken of all of us there. You can see James, you can see Ron, you can see Max. And you can see everybody's name here at the bottom, um, where they uh, came from and, and so forth. Uh, we don't know where they came from. Tony Jacoby came from Staten Island. Max, you came from the borough president. I came from the mayor. I was the mayor. The mayor, mayor by the yeah. time. Ron, you were a mayor. Yeah. Jane, you were a mayor. I was a mayor. Joel was Queens. Richard Schaefer was uh, chair of the- Tony uh, Jacoby was Staten Island. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Schaefer was the uh, director of the department plus the chair. Brenda Levin was uh, Manhattan borough president. Jacob Ward was Bronx. Victor Alicia, mayor. 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 Yeah. Ed Rogowski, Brooklyn. 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 Yeah. Amanda was city council. And Deborah was mayor, mm -hmm. right? OK, OK, there we go. So those were the appointments. That's who they all are. And we'll look, look where they are later. Right, uh, just, just one thing about the Columbia Connection. So two faculty members were involved in the appointment of the commission. and. One was chair of the commission, so our former dean at GSAP, Richard Schaefer, was the chair of the city planning commission, and a, a former faculty member from SEPA, Mary Dinkins, was the mayor. Right, exactly. <laughs> and of course, Amanda was also a- Of course, and Amanda GSAP. was a graduate of the program. That's right, she got a master's here. All right, so this is a ULERP situation, 59 community boards. The community boards were given much more power as were the borough presidents, and the city planning commission was given the power that if it turned something down, that was it. That was the end, yes. uh, which was an extraordinary power to have at, at that time. That was, did not exist before. Uh, we can talk about how that was avoided, but uh, yeah. that was. And thus the title of the panel. Right. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and so uh, a number of the things that were instituted in that charter still exist today. Others don't. But the fair share criteria are still existent. They have been amended since the time we passed them, but they are amended and used. 
the capital strategy is still in place. 197A plans, I want you all to talk about what's happened and they're in place, but the last one that you discussed was 2009. Not particularly effective. And a citywide statement of need is required. The mayor give that report, or the planning deal with that report, and that would feed into the capital budget. And of course, the zoning resolution was the center of much of our work, as we were discussing before. I just wanted to quickly talk about some of the cases we had to deal with. Here was the National Tennis Center. We had a mayor who liked tennis, among other things. But the real question was, would this sport, which was known in New York as a world, you know, you think about what a world city has, and it's a very unique thing. One of them was the fact we had these tennis championships. And the question was, they needed to expand. How would this happen? And we went through many discussions, shaking your head over there, as to how this should happen, and also share the benefits of having such a center with the community. And so we came up with a number of ideas there. And also, when it took up more land in a park, how are we going to replace that land, park land? And we came up with a solution there. The area basin was a question of delivering city services. We wanted to create a police zone there. And this was pretty tricky in this particular area as well. Lots of negotiations about what kind of community benefits would occur by doing that. Riverside South. Boy, we could have stopped the fucker then. I think we're the only women in this room that have a kiss from that guy right here. I know. And didn't your daughter answer the phone? At any rate, 23 acre site. This was really contentious. And we can talk more about that. And at the other end of the scale, we were dealing with how you dealt with homelessness. And this was a woman shelter in the new process housing, what the neighborhood thought of that. So we had many, many discussions, many projects, a full range in all the different boroughs, all the different scales of things. It was really an extraordinary time. And it was an extraordinary time for this group on the, on the board because the discussions were really fantastic. And um, as we look at, when I um, reflected on this experience, I wrote an article in the APA Journal, which I tell all doctoral students, you have, if you have an experience like this, you have to turn it into something. You can't just be a practitioner. You have to learn from it and try and put forward uh, the learnings from that. At any rate, uh, the thesis of this was that democratic planning really did occur under the uh, charter revision. And I was looking at what happened in the Hewlett process with regard to how, whether citizens were able to change things or not. They never were able to stop a project, I would say, but they were able to shape a project. And that was very, very important, that shaping that happened at these various stages of the Euler activity. And it was always inclusive. All 29 boards were involved. And the citizen participation was demonstrable to all of the political leaders as you went along. And that was really important in terms of shaping decisions. So I think it was a pretty exciting time, and it still is an exciting time to be involved in planning. So, what happened to them? Where are they now? <laughs> <laughs> and so, Victor Alessia, President Ruka, uh, um, me, Amanda, as from Bloomberg Philanthropies, uh, Tony uh, was a New, a New York Supreme Court Justice, he's since retired, Maxine is right here, James is here, Brenda is a land use consultant. I'd say Brenda probably knew the land use better than anybody in, yes. in this group. Joel Mealy uh, died, Ed Rogowski died, Ron Schiffman is here. Not because he, they were on the planet. No, <laughs> no, they had very distinguished <laughs> careers. Uh, Joel went on to be head of the building department, um, and Ed was a faculty at Brooklyn College and a, a quite a very important <coughs> spokesman for this, this work. Um, Ron is here. Robert Schaefer was the former president of Green Tree Foundation. Jacob Ward, I don't know what happened to him. He was a good deal older than he was. He, 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 he was my age then, so. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yes, he's yes. Passed. Oh, he has passed, okay. And Deborah Wright is now a managing director of the Rockefeller Foundation. So um, we've all kind of kept going. Yeah. <laughs> we're, not, we're not in the street. Yeah. <laughs> if I could, I, I, I think it's important to understand the context in which we took over. Uh, because 1989, we saw the fall of the Iron Curtain in Eastern Europe. Uh, and so the uh, wall in Berlin came down. In 1990, we saw uh, Nelson Mandela being released in South Africa. And as a result, we saw the emergence of a new South Africa. We came out in New York out of a period of time where we were thinking about planned shrinkage as the future for the city. Because planners tend to sometimes look at data and project it in a straight line into the future, never understanding there can be an inflection and a change in the direction that goes. So we were 
uh, there were people advocating that we abandon certain parts of the city, we protect other parts of the city, and we invest in only some limited areas. That whole idea of planned shrinkage fell to the wayside. We began, as uh, uh, was mentioned, we were, saw a great deal of deindustrialization of the city, but we were coming down to the bare bones, that we needed to have some form of manufacturing in order to protect some of our vital industries or, or vital functions. We needed people to frame the artwork going into the museums. We needed to do set design for some of the new uh, uh, industries that were coming up in the city of New York. The film industry is basically a building industry within the filming industry itself. So we began to see a lot of those things be at, uh, emerge. 1987, two years before our commission, the UN released the Brundtland Report. And we began understanding uh, in 19, uh, right around that time about the whole issue of uh, sustainable development and, and, and the impact of climate change. 1992 was a year in which the UN began to argue that we needed to really address climate change. We were making those decisions about how the future of the city within that context. New York City was also emerging, as I mentioned just briefly before, from this planned shrinkage period, but we were shrinking as a city. We were, uh, in the late 60s and into the 70s, losing between 30 to 36,000 units a year. That's about a, a five-family building, about three or four five-family buildings a day being abandoned in the city. By abandonment, we meant people were leaving uh, their, uh, behind their ownership of those buildings. Some were occupied. So we were sitting, we were suffering from a period of economic withdrawal. From the banks weren't investing in the city, and the victims of that lack of investment, of disinvestment, were poor people. Today, what many of you are confronting is, I think, the success of our period and the problems of your period, which is displacement and overinvestment, with a great deal of people now being displaced because of uh, di overinvestment. So we've seen a, a, a complete change, but that was the framework. And so when you hear what we talk about, understanding it was a different time and a different set of uh, challenges. That's, that's an extraordinary <laughs> rendition. It's just um, and I can remember as, as, as staff to these guys at city planning during the 90s, just being overwhelmed by the number of things we were doing. We were doing new plans for, for Long Island City, for waterfront zoning. Um, we had started to work on something called unified bulk, which was a way of getting you know, all of the buildings in the city to actually function through zoning the way we thought they should. I mean, there, there are too many kinds of rules in the city as it is. And also, there was an enormous growth in the zoning resolution itself. So, so one of the things that I wanted to ask, and I've been meaning to ask this for years, <laughs> is what, <laughs> what was the view on the commission of, of the often repeated suggestion that the zoning resolution be completely revamped? It was done in 1916, as those of you who, who've taken Pernama in my course on zoning know, 1916, 1961 were sort of the major events, 1975 as well, in terms of the zoning resolution. But why have we not been able to, to shorten it or to, to revamp it? EIS? Well, yeah, EIS, but also there are a lot of vested interests. Uh, there are whole firms uh, whose work is nothing but dealing with the code as it is. Uh, they would go out of business if it were completely revamped. Land use attorneys. Uh, land use attorneys, um, even some urban planners uh, working in the private <laughs> sector, believe it or not, uh, folks who work on EISs. Um, but also, I'd like to shift the question but, a but little bit. But, but do talk about the EIS, because that really was the block. Yes, I will. It was but, too but, expensive. You couldn't do it. But I also want to, you can do that too. But I also, <laughs> <laughs> but I also want to go to what I think is the real underlying question, which is planning through zoning instead right. of planning through planning. Um, <laughs> so my personal um, feeling when I was on the commission is it would be nice to actually have a planning commission that looked at things comprehensively uh, with zoning only as a tool. Mm -hmm. So to me, simply revamping uh, the zoning text and map um, would have been somewhat disingenuous because mm -hmm. it seems to me the real goal should have been developing a comprehensive uh, planning protocol uh, the same way it is in every other major city in the US um, I just want to bring James into it for a minute. 
Uh, some of you know I do some work in China. I do some work in China because of this gentleman. Uh, we met on the planning commission and uh, he invited me to do some work with him. Uh, but the reason I like working in China is in China you actually plan. And the planner is involved from the inception through to the uh, end of the project. And the end of the project actually looks like a, a thoughtful, comprehensive plan. And you may argue with the political structure, you may argue you know, a, a lot. Um, but still, the, the uh, US, it seems to me, is one of the few countries in the world where planners, uh, even though we've got more power from 89 to 90, uh, less power than most planners around the world. Interesting. And also, you should, you should know, too, that the Planning Commission, one of the changes <coughs> that happened was that the Planning Commission was increased from seven members you know, appointed by the mayor to, to 13 members that were appointed by the mayor, still in the majority, but then also by the borough presidents and the, the city council, the public advocate. So, I mean, there are you know, significant changes happening at this time on the commission that made it more broad-based. Now, but it's interesting that you all were mayoral appointments, but very different sort of ideologically. How did that work? How did these appointments come about? It would be interesting to know, I think. Magic. I, magic, okay, but, but magic. One thing that did happen, I think you notice if you go to the list uh, before and after 89, is that more actual planners were on the planning commission, mm -hmm. including academic uh, and an architect. Uh, and it, well, there, there was, I was always the only architect. Yeah. Maybe the first architect. There was always an architect. No, you were the second one. <laughs> yeah, but there was always an architect. Uh, but I think the individual decisions made by the uh, appointing entities, uh, I think they decided this is the first time out. This is going to be important. We're going to make a lot of rules and regulations as a planning commission. Why not bring on planners? And that was not the case up to then of mostly attorneys or right. community activists. Mm -hmm. I yeah. would want to go back to the zoning resolution because I was appointed as the uh, first Asian American and also the architect. And I do a lot of zoning practice. At the time in my final state Queens, we were the specialized in zoning. So I think it was very difficult. We did talk about zoning revamp. It's very difficult, like Maxine said, you would be cutting away a lot of uh, special interest groups to really thrive on the zoning. Plus, it's the other side of the issue is it's always better to know with the devil you know better. You know, because when you try to change, for example, the tax code, uh, it would, uh, there's even more problem. I think zoning, New York City zoning is fine the way it is. Uh, people can always find around the way to, uh, to increase their FAR. I want to say serving the planning commission was a big life changer for me when I was the Architects, actually, I guess uh, the, I got the uh, endorsement for the Architectural Association. I think we have uh, collected about 3,000 architects because I was actually uh, running an office doing a lot of new buildings in Queens. So if you go back to the Dutch report back in 1988, 89, 30% uh, of the new buildings in Queens were built by James Chow and Associates. The other thing was the, uh, being the first Asian American, also second youngest member next to Debbie. Debbie was uh, six months younger than I was. Mm -hmm. Okay, we can well, just keep moving. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I think the, uh, the representation of Asia was so very important uh, that I was able to, with the assistant for Ginny, and uh, we did the Chinatown study, not with the city budget, but Chinatown has always been an uh, enclave where people just ignore the planning for the area. So that's why you have a lot of dirty streets, difficult to serve. So, uh, so was, I was fortunate that uh, when the Ginny was uh, teaching at the uh, Hunters were able to mobilize a lot of graduate students. And uh, when well, we did the semester study, and we actually published with the uh, Chinatown uh, study guide. And APA Pride. Yeah, <laughs> APA Pride. Oh, I did all that. Oh, so it was great. Yeah, yeah. 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 But we should talk about the power dynamics of, of this new enlarged uh, yeah, commission. Right. I think it would be interesting because we have seven mayor people and then six from different places as they were appointed. And there was a great desire on the commission not to have a split vote because we wanted the city council to uh, adhere to our decisions. And so we did a lot of uh, negotiation behind the scenes uh, to come up with the compromises so that we, I don't think we ever had a vote, maybe one or two that were split. Yeah. Uh, that uh, I was, a, I was um, a dissenting on a compromise. 
Yeah, but, but, but not enough to get the city council out. No, no. no. Which is what and, we and, and to your member, point, members. to your point, I don't uh, ever remember the conversation splitting around. Uh, oh, I'm a, I'm a mayoral appointee. You're a board president yeah. appointee. Um, I think we glumped more into left, right, center, perhaps, in, in our in our approach. Um, uh, there are a couple of times when Tony Giacobbe, who sat next to me because I was a G and he was a G, I sat alphabetically. He sat alphabetically, <laughs> and uh, there was a Staten Island um, matter. He was from Staten Island. He would lean over and say, "I need this." Uh, Maxine, I think you need to vote for this one. <laughs> I don't know what that meant. Uh, but, um, you know, and, and often it was said in jest, uh, but that was the kind of conversation. But we, we didn't, when we came together, say, well, Queens wants it this way. Uh, another no thing that, uh, 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 another thing that happened uh, that first year is we went around and actually had meetings in the boroughs. Um, and um, we tr tried to do that on an ongoing basis. Uh, didn't quite uh, quite work, uh, but I really didn't know anything about Staten Island and very little about Queens. Uh, we went; uh, th these were open meetings, and we also had dinner afterwards. The the um, uh, uh, commissioner from that borough would choose a place uh, to eat, and we would uh, eat and talk about the borough issues. It um, it was something like eating together. Uh, <laughs> that and drinking together. Well, the reason we were going to the boroughs was to deal with the fair share criteria. And as you remember, every borough said, we have too much of this. We don't need any of this. You know, we have a more than our fair share. And so we had to negotiate how to think about what fair share meant. And we were really tied by the law that wouldn't let us think across categories. We had to think of a fair share for homeless shelters, a fair share for sewage treatment plants, and so forth which was quite annoying that the law yeah. bound us into the restrictions. But Jeannie kept us on track. I mean, ser <laughs> no, <laughs> seriously. No, thank you. We want to bring Bill, who is regular in the audience, who is yeah. the, uh, the council yes. in the yes. National yes. Planning Commission. Mm -hmm. uh, Bill is the, our chief council, and he really advises yeah. yeah. which line does. Uh, Stand up and we recognize <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Some of us didn't listen yeah. to yeah. Bill. Yeah. But <laughs> and Pernima. Since you're sitting there, you yeah, stand yeah, up. Yeah, she was yeah. also working. Right, right. Shaking your head. I think, the staff, yeah. I think also the staff, the planning commission at the time was one of the probably the best people we had worked with. They're very yeah. able to come up with the criteria. So we would have a very candid, open discussion, not leading to a one side. So everybody's looking at the issue by the fact itself, rather than any kind of politician coming to put some arms. Yeah. I remember vividly Donald Trump was the one of the for the, oh, yeah. the Trump uh, World uh, Tower. That, that was Riverside Penn State Sound. Sound. Riverside Sound. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 No, no, he also came in for the towers. Yeah. Riverside, Riverside Sound. Yeah. 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 We all remember yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I do want to go back to your question, though. I do think there was a major push to try to get things that were as of right. Mm -hmm. uh, so that Because the city was really worried about how we create development, not obstacles to development. So a lot of the zoning... Uh, once it was agreed upon, you could begin to get an as of right uh, procedure and process underway. I think I fully agree with uh, you know the idea uh, of of that the commission is now and then focused primarily on zoning, mm -hmm. and that we really need to go back to planning and. Uh, and that was really a fundamental flaw at that time. It continues to be a flaw today. Uh, we use the environmental impact analysis as a way, an excuse not to go there. I, don't, I think we can do it with or without the environmental mm -hmm. analyses. Uh, they should be coming and they should be part of the process and they should be at the, end, uh, at the beginning of the pipe, not at the end of the pipe. Because what we do is we develop a, a plan, we develop, you do the entire development scheme, and then at the end you evaluate its environmental impact rather than using environment as a, a fundamental way of writing the program for the plan. Right, and not yeah. for as a right development. Yeah. But I'd like to uh, and that to means uh, they're slightly different versions. And, uh, and it was to David Dinkins' credit, and I think we really need to, uh, he, he appointed to the commission a variety of commissioners who had different backgrounds. While we all were physical planners, uh, we all came with a different political slant. 
he appointed me, and I think I got the one-year appointment first because he wanted <laughs> to make sure. <laughs> but, I got five. Uh, he got, she got five because he knew her. <laughs> and I, I was reappointed. Uh, but uh, the issue was that he came to me and said, you've always been arguing against the city, or you know, fighting on behalf of neighborhoods. I was an advocate. I come from the theory of planning, of advocacy planning. Not Solomonsky, okay. but Paul Davidoff. And basically, the idea that there are certain people in this city that are never represented by planners, the people who don't have the resources, who have been excluded. And we decided that we would pr provide our expertise to low and moderate income groups so their voice could be heard in the but planning Ron, process. I want to talk he, about let me just how finish you snuck the point. In something. Let me Can finish I talk the point. about how you snuck something in as a planner? Right. <laughs> you got him, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let me tell you. One of the things that we had to do with the Department of Real Property, whatever it's called now, would come in with stacks of yeah. property and want us to approve their sale. Yeah. And they'd be totally unrelated. They'd be a little stack this high of the lot. And Ron, to his credit, said, hey, we're going to stop this. We are not going to approve any more of these sales unless you come back with lots of assemblages and turn these into plans. So you work within the structure to bring planning. And your argument was how often poor people yeah. bought these pieces of land and they ended up on the auction block again and again. Yeah, so I that, think that, you know. But I always work within the system. Hmm? No, 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 no. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is that there were, yeah. even though you're saying no planning done, I think with the right kind of intelligence, which Ron had, you can insert planning within a structure that's not very favorable yeah. to it. But the one point I wanted to make is that what David did tell me, in a pro he said, I don't care how you vote, but never surprise me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Never surprise me. So when I opposed, felt I had to oppose something, I would let Schaefer know or someone in City Hall understand that I could not live with that vote and I would vote against it. And he never held that against me. Okay. And it was really, I think, in, to his credit, that he so wanted he that kind votes. of diversity. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so yeah, because he had the votes. Well, you know, I, I could tell you a story about that. I don't know if you remember this, but and I don't remember the issue, um, but I was about to vote uh, against something, and I told Richard, I told the chair, and uh, he said, no, no, I don't want you to, to uh, vote against it. He said, the mayor doesn't want you to vote against this. Yeah. So, of course, I would worked with the mayor for four years. <laughs> I picked up the phone and he said, no, you do what you want to do. <laughs> so I um, came time to vote and I thought I had a pretty well done statement and uh, I didn't mention the mayor and Richard got up and said, Commissioner Griffith is flaunting her relationship <laughs> with the mayor of this city. Well, of course, after that, everybody wanted to talk to me <laughs> because, <laughs> because they felt. That's um, why you got appointment at Columbia. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that was, uh, that was it. But also, um, uh, based, you know, talking about with what uh, you mentioned with regard to poor people, one of the things you have to understand about that era is the city owned about 65% of Harlem. So um, at that point, we were giving away, HPD was giving away buildings for a dollar. We were begging for people to come into the city. Um, as, um, as Ron said, you guys are dealing with the success of that situation. And I know because uh, we met some of the PhD students are working on issues of gentrification. The person who comes up with the formula about how to have appropriate development without tipping over into gent gentrification is going to get every prize uh, <laughs> possible. Um, because everybody wants to be able to drink their vanilla latte at the Starbucks. Everybody wants their snows plowed. Uh, everybody wants the amenities that come with development, but nobody wants to be pushed out of their home. And uh, is there a way of uh, calculating, of developing an algorithm that planners can follow to get to that point? Uh, that would be fantastic. Uh, we are perhaps on slightly different ends of the spectrum, uh, but I think that- I always sit to the left of her. <laughs> but that's to the but but I think that objective that mission is one that we both share. You know uh, the one one ninety seven A plan that had a lot of impact 
was I think the first one that we approved, and that was for the South Bronx. I think it was yeah. Community Board 4, because that was done by a group. It, it was led by Harry D. Rienzo of mm -hmm. Banana Kelly in the Bronx, and it came forward, and for the first time, it challenged the city's policy of suburbanizing urban areas. They said the density being proposed by the city was too low, and that, in a way, set a framework of one of the issues that we have to confront today is that for a period of time we were building one and two family yeah, houses Nehemiah where we should have been building at a higher density and it actually looked at the future in a way uh, how do you look at a community what is its infrastructure what's the carrying capacity of that infrastructure and planned around that and what would be our goal and i, I think that 197a plan till today has had its repercussions. But that was another example. Again, we have a lot of leadership in this in calling that, because it wasn't just the 197A plan. There were different zoning of yeah. things that we had to do up there. And you would vote them down. You would say it's not dense enough. And you would convince the rest of us that, yes. Well, so just a point of information, there. the 197A plans. Oh, they don't know? Well, <laughs> some, of do, some, some of them do, some of them don't. Some of them don't. 197A is a section of the, the city charter that that allows communities to offer a plan for their neighborhoods, which then are reviewed by city planning, and if adopted, can become yeah, yeah. law. 197C is what we call Euler. But the successful plans are the ones that, again, worked within the framework that the only tool we really have to help you out is zoning. I think what 197As did is it brought communities together, um, in, including uh, the one where we sit, to talk about um, you know, how many trees do you want, where should the school be, where should the park be, but then when they went to city planning, there, were very, there was very little they could do to effectuate anything but the zoning. So none has been done for 12 years. I know. Why happened? is that? Be I'd like to know that myself. I think because they've been ineffective, because it sounds like you can do a plan, but you can't really do a plan, because you can't, at city planning, you can't adopt a plan and hold other agencies to it. Uh, DOT's not gonna care, EDC's not gonna care. Mm. Again, it may be a tool for advocacy, but you can't move a plan through and have it have the force of law unless it's zoning. And what ends up happening is communities are sort of trained to zone. And mm. to zone, you don't need a 197A. It's advisory, I mean, it never yes. was force yeah. of law. Yeah. Right. Where it but worked well is where it gave the community a sense of what its vision was and how they could begin to fight for it. In Sunset Park, the community has put together now an alternative to industry cities plan. Mm -hmm. And it is now mobilizing the community in what will be a fight tomorrow, I guess, before the City Planning Commission on whether the community's grid plan, which is a green resiliency industrial development strategy versus what industry city wants, which is to primarily continue its trend towards, and here's my bias, towards retail as opposed to towards jobs that benefit the folks who live in the adjoining area. So the grid plan is not a 197A plan, but it has been put together uh, by a women's collective working with the community that really started looking at what is the potential for this area, what is really the challenges given climate change and sea level rise, how do you take an area that we know in 15 years will be 26% will be underwater and you adjoins a highway that needs to be reconstructed? How do you take that area and turn it away from functioning as a manufacturing and industrial zone? And so those issues, I think, will come to the fore. But it's because people are now not filing the 197A process, but they're yeah. using that local initiative effort to organize. And, and the, a little closer to home, um, uh, West Harlem did a 197A. And one of the first things that was done uh, by the planners uh, who came uh, forward to the Manhattan Bill is take a look at that 197A and say, we're not gonna do anything that does violence to it. We're gonna support the park by the waterfront. We're gonna support the idea of the streets. So that 197A, uh, because it was a developer that wasn't gonna go anywhere, we were gonna be here, so we just will not make enemies. Uh, uh, that 197A was a blueprint for what the community uh, wanted. 
Um, I don't think it went to city planning. So, so Mitch, Mitch Silver was yeah. the. It takes resources to do this, and, and mm -hmm. places like Columbia, your master's studios could be doing 197A Lynch Kazoo, which would be. Well, we had a, the Urban Technical Assistance Program, which was you know, part of GSAP, part of the urban planning program that actually sponsored community groups to do 197A plans. It's still doing it? No. What happened? It, um, it lost its funding. Funding. Yeah. Oh, it's all about money. It's all it's about all money. It's America. So, um, so just a question about, um, we saw the list of sort of accomplishments that, that this planning commission did. What were your biggest regrets about the time on planning? What projects did you push or want to have pushed that didn't actually succeed? And have they succeeded since? Well, there were details of big projects that we wanted. Uh, let's take Riverside South. Um, that was well, 20, 23 acres or whatever. And one of the things that we wanted to happen was the highway to be suppressed underground and make this giant park. Unfortunately, at the time this project came forward, the state had just invested in the, in the elevated highway. And it's still there. I think we all thought, well, maybe 40 years will come down and we can get that underground highway in that park that could then be done. So I think that there mm -hmm. were things like that. Um, I actually would like to talk a little bit about big infrastructure projects like the third water tunnel. That was really exciting. Um, none of us knew too much about that. We sure <laughs> learned about it very quickly. It's built, beginning to be built. There's a question up there. Oh, the third water tunnel. Um, I, I came into, I moved from architecture to planning uh, to do a plan for Harlem. That was my, um, uh, that was my mission. Um, and when I joined um, the uh, city planning department, uh, uh, and then when I went to work for the borough president, who was an African American borough president, and then when I went on the commission, uh, the, uh, there was a sense that, uh, I was born here, we didn't know where the community was going. And not that I could have foreseen where we are now, uh, where I go into a restaurant and I'm the only one that looks like me in the restaurant. I knew that it wasn't, it wasn't directed uh, towards um, a future that would benefit everyone in the community. And um, one of my disappointments, and again, one of the reasons I work in other places, is that there didn't seem to be a vehicle in city government to do that. That the mission was scattered over many agencies, that uh, the eight year term of any borough president or mayor was too short to effectuate um, uh, that kind of thing. And so it's a generalized uh, disappointment uh, that there still isn't that kind of um, vehicle uh, in city. I'd like to add probably one of the regrets. This is, I've never discussed with these people, because one of the things we, <laughs> oh. we, we, the we have enjoyed is the great friendship with each other. And I was appointed by mayor as the Asian representative. And so I, had, I was able to bring in the issue of Chinatown flushing. But I think one of the regrets was that uh, with the 197 uh, planning was basically for very mature, well-established community support. For the immigrants who came in, they were not able to use the resources. So I wish at the time that the city planning department has its own small uh, internal planning units who can assist, such as Flushing, which I uh, understand is you know, it's been booming since I left New York City. And I left New York City 25 years ago. So, uh, so, but by the time that you know, we were looking at the College Point the industrial area to see if that can be put into new use. But it, the, I think one of the exemplary budget we saw was the flushing the wastewater treatment plant, which is now is a beautiful uh, structure at the park. But had we had more resources within the city planning department to guide these new immigrants coming into New York City, I think we'll be better serving the community. Because when I come back to flushing now. Even I changed a lot of zonings, but I really feel chaotic. And I feel like coming back from now, I come back from China to Flushing, it's like coming back to a third world country. You know, which is amazing, you know, how slow the whole thing. In fact, I come back to New York, I see the whole New York is backwards. But we can talk about that another day. Mm -hmm. Why the planning has failed. Well, I was able to, you know, Bill and I came to China for the first time in 1991. And he was the one who said, I'll come back. He never did, I did. I went back permanently. 
And my parents never thought I was going to be migrating back to China. They gave, took my father a long time to get out of China. <laughs> but we're thriving. And I think what we have learned is taking part. I also translate the whole Euler into Chinese. And I was able to teach oh, God. what to avoid. What to <laughs> <laughs> and I think we are doing very well. Right. Yeah, James, know. can we get a copy of that? For the, the Chinese yeah. copy? Yes, yeah. yes. I'll send oh. you a copy. Yeah. <laughs> are you those who also wrote a Chinese, an English book, uh, the, you know, a straight talk about yeah. Chinese uh, planning, uh, which was published. I wrote that with Janice Strong. They unfortunately, read out the copies. I think I was able to put one copy in and just disappeared. James, yeah. one of uh, my colleagues at Pratt, the, the the successor to me at the Pratt Center, actually worked with the Asian community out in Flushing and uh, recently uh, made headway with basement apartments. Uh, uh, that was way, later, that was later. Yeah. But I was saying at and the so time, the quite going to dog but a lot, was but a lot of the places. I would just say this was, had we had that time, because we had such great staff, they were so accommodating. And I think also the new charter, it's a brand new chapter. So there was no any kind of pre-existing individuals who hold seniority over the other people. So we're able to discuss a lot of issues from grown up without pretext of we gotta do this, what we've been working on this for years. So we are able to establish that base. And I think one of the things I miss the most is the, 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 the chemistry between the 13 commissioners. We're very, very, I mean, we had a lot of fun. We all had yeah, jokes. We have more laugh than any other community yeah. hearing. We never show. mentioned the sex hearings. <laughs> oh, oh the sexual. And that was one of the things I dissented on. I was for for it. The the um. The, the sex zones. Right? It was the. Oh, uh, the sex zone. Yeah, the yeah, problem. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. No, that was Edward Gowski and I dissented. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody wants to hear about Edward that. Edward Gowski and I dissented. Maybe they have questions. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe this is a good time actually to ask if there are questions for our panelists here. Um, so we'll open it up to the floor. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, well, was executive director of the Department of City <laughs> Planning, just so you know. Um, she hasn't changed much. <laughs> I think I, a couple of you sort of were here in the planning profession when we had the Board of Estimates and then went on to the Commission as well. The sort of one of the things that we heard about the change sort of in the 1989 was that the planning process prior to that was highly politicized and that it could be held up by like a single person from a single forum. And my experience since I've been sort of here with the planning commission particularly has been that the commission has always been a very thoughtful and a very professional body. And it's not that people didn't represent their sort of um, appointed them, but as some of you have alluded to, there was sort of, it wasn't a process that was perceived as being sort of political and going with the wind, whichever way the wind was going. And I wonder if, if that in fact there is truth to that, what do you guys think about that? And then I would add the question to that, which is that ultimately the process does end at a very political place, the council. Well, that and was going to so, be my answer. So <laughs> It's just flipped. It used to be that the politics came at the beginning. Um, so that if you, if you had a borough president that had a good planning staff, was uh, able to negotiate with the developer, re was really open to the community, you probably got as good a deal as you are going to get. Um, the planning commission at the time was sort of irrelevant. Um, they, uh, it was, uh, uh, their, uh, we looked to their opinions um, to make sure we weren't too far in one direction or another, to make sure we weren't going to get sued uh, to understand the zoning. Uh, but that was where the deals were struck, and the borough president of, let's say, Brooklyn, um, if uh, that person, he or she, liked a development moving forward, the other borough presidents, uh, with, with some exceptions, would go along. Now that's the case at the end of the process, with the council. The council also has that gentle person's agreement. So if uh, a council, uh, councilman, councilwoman uh, from a certain district doesn't like the de Blasio plan for X, Y, Z, uh, the other council members in a political, uh, and not necessarily nefarious political politics, the, the way we run the country, um, 
will say, okay, we'll go along with you, again, except for a, a, a few exceptions. So you're not gonna wring, in my view, politics out of the, uh, out of the system. I think the difference was, and you know, being self-aggrandizing a little bit, was the quality of the commission, uh, of the commissioners, uh, and the fact that for the first time, commissioners could stop a project. Yes. And because we had the power to stop it, we didn't have to stop it. Uh, because developers would then come and say, we, we, we already have a lot of money in this project, how can we shape it? Or there'd be a, there'd be a public hearing. And we'd say, look, the people don't like it. <laughs> what even, are you gonna do? But even more importantly, we were able to discuss it. We yes. were able to ask questions. Yes. We debated as a group in front of a public audience as opposed to what I think has taken place in, in subsequent years, where it is much more rigidly controlled by the chair. Yeah. yeah. Hey, what Maxine referred to actually has a name in planning. It's called um, aldermanic um, yeah. privilege. Mm -hmm. So um, it's a common thing to have happen on, on planning commission. And I've worked in maybe 10 cities, and it's, you know, whether it's an alderman or whether it's a council, or whether it's a group of people in somebody's living room, uh, I've never seen a, a, a process without it. But to, to Ron's point, I mean, I think my question really was, was this flipping of the sort of um, the political deal making leading to better plans and better projects by the end of it? Yes, but I, I disagree a little bit. I, I think, I mean, discussing was important, but I think it was, um, I really believe in the, in the title of the panel. I think it was the fact that the, the planning commission had power. We had power to right. stop yeah. something. Right. I, I, don't to say yeah. that, you know, I, I don't the, disagree. The commissioners with that. knew the game too. Every step of the way, they had to give something. So the community yeah. board, they had to give something. The borough president got to give something. Give something to the planning commission. And the power of being able to stop it was terrific. And then, as a commission, we really did work hard to get consensus on the decision so that the city council wouldn't screw around with it. And, and, and that was the leadership of, that was Richard Schaefer, who really insisted. But one of the things that hampered the planning <laughs> staff is that, unlike what James wanted, you didn't have that amount of manpower or women right. power. The number of planners in New York City for the population of New York City is dismally low. And we need to expand the, the belief in community planning by really putting out community planners you can actually work by community boards or like certain cities in the United States. You could actually generate much more planning work. We worked with one of your students, Jocelyn Chait, who led the planning effort in Williamsburg for the 197A. We did it in, in the Greenpoint area. We worked jointly together, but because Williamsburg and Greenpoint didn't talk to each other, we separated out the planning within that community board and came forth with a very good set of recommendations for the 197A plan. Unfortunately, it was distorted later on by the zoning, and you've gotten some of the overdevelopment there. But I, I must say, it's still better than not having had a plan. And so some of the areas were preserved. The industrial zone along uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, creek, Newtown Creek, is now being studied and is, is thriving. And so it, there are some elements of that plan that have survived. But some of it has really been too large scale development. And so sometimes we overdevelop as well as underdevelop. And we have to make sure we come to a reasonable balance. Exactly right. Question? Evan, yes. do you have a question? Um, yeah, I, I kind of wondered uh, with the most recent developments in the Lennox Terrace rezoning, if the ability for a community or the city council, the planning commission to have influence to be able to stop a project, then is the new. I think that is the answer. That's the zoning yeah. ordinance. Yeah. Yeah, Bernadette.
Access to the waterfront, I think, is. Yeah. I think starting everybody on the same page is very important in the process. Like they, they said, the old man uh, mentality in any kind of decision is all equal. I think the moment we enjoy the most is we are able to talk equally. There's nobody there to say, I know this issue more than the other people. We are able to discuss the issue, uh, really evaluate the merits, and give, you know, give, give our decision, yes or no, on the decision. I, I hardly have any, well, more than years, we never had a contentious vote. Well, we were just whispering uh, here. We were like just, we were very friendly. That was really important. Yeah, we were, I think we were the just public realm. Yeah, the public we, realm. We, we, we um, despite what you hear uh, about slightly different points of view, uh, we really had a pretty similar baseline view. You know, we wanted view corridors. We, we wanted waterfront access uh, 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 by the public to waterfront. A lot of the sort of liberal, progressive, lefty planning stuff, um, there was no argument. Uh, we just sort of looked at each other and said, well, of course, uh, you know, we're going to, we're going to. We're protecting the public realm. And, and yeah. by the public. Um, and, and um, you know, that formed uh, the basis, I think, of the. Do you remember the curb cut of, argument? Oh, yes, I do <laughs> remember the curb cut. Though I lost on the, on the uh, fire truck. Sure. That, was the the one, that was the one I, uh, um, I dissented on. We were, we were criticized because we spent a good deal of time um, saying that certain brownstones could not have curb cuts. <laughs> and um, the reason was that all these curb cuts that were being petitioned for interrupted the sidewalk. I mean, if you want to walk them, this is what I mean by the protection of the value was the protection of the public realm. And what is the public realm? It's your sidewalk, it's your streets, it's your waterfront, it's um, the spaces that are given to zoning variances if you get special permits mm -hmm. and so forth. And so we spent a lot of time making sure that the public realm was really public. Right, and, and that was an important issue. Yes, it end. was. Yeah. Yeah. When a commission worked on something, you should understand too that the staff is then given the task of writing a 50-page report on, on, <laughs> on whatever they have passed down to us. Well, you could have done it in one page. <laughs> <laughs> Here's where I, I really differ, even if it's the Pratt Center. Uh, and that is, we shouldn't be looking at zoning, but we should be looking at that development and that plan for that area and see what are the best tools to apply to that particular area. I could take you to public housing that has land that could be built on, but that land is better used to manage water that will be coming into those communities. So that, in that case, I would not want to see that zoning change.
for dollars. There are other places where it may very well make sense. And in that context, you then develop and look at the tools you want to implement the plan. But what we have is zoning, and we look at it and try to apply it to a fixed situation, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And I think we have to be very careful and begin to look at what do you really want to achieve in that development, rather than come in with the toolkit before you know which tools to use. The other point that I, I have to make is that we have an existential crisis in New York City, and that is that there are waterfront communities, I'm talking about the Rockaways, uh, parts of Red Hook, parts of uh, Coney Island, that may very well be underwater within our lifetime, and definitely within your children's lifetimes. And how do we take the 30,000 people living in public housing in the Rockaways and find a place for them to live safely? Because we may have to think about retreating from certain communities. Where do we put the families? How do we address those issues? Some people want to build a wall, a barrier for $30 billion. Maybe we need to invest $5 billion in eradicating poverty. We've got to look at those issues, and those issues have to be looked at today, because we don't have time to implement the plans over a long period of time. And they have to be addressed soon. And nobody's doing that in the city. But Me how many people believe in global warming in New York City? I mean, uh, Donald Trump denied that. Well, yeah. he, he, we're he's, on he's the, not a New Yorker. On the Upper West Side, everybody uh, <laughs> agrees. We know what it is. You know, I, I, ha I was asked by the Office of Emergency Management to take folks from Washington around and from Hawaii around because they were too busy dealing with Superstorm Sandy. I saw what it did in the Rockaways. I saw what it did uh, in uh, Seagate and, uh, on Coney Island. It ripped up concrete. You know, it ripped it up and moved it 15 yards. And it is amazing to see that. And it's getting worse. And we don't, and what we're doing is we're investing in housing in areas we shouldn't allow that housing to be built. So we've got to start thinking about it in ways that we haven't before. And that's a generational issue that your generation of planners have to address. How do we make sure there's no disconnect between our planning and development activities and the long-term survival of some of our communities? And I think we need to start looking at not quantitative development, but how we deal with the quality of the city. And I think those... Yeah. But I think you need to prepare yourself by understanding the power of zoning. I mean, that is the tool. And how much... Well, I guess you're doing it here, right? But you really need to see what just changing a few words can do or changing a district yeah. can do to understand that at the bottom, it's money. Land use is money. I mean, that's a good question in terms of, yeah. So two things. One, um, the last comprehensive master plan in New York City was the 1969 master plan. And city government doesn't really do master planning anymore. There was, as part of the Chinatown Working Group, um, that whole nine-year um, effort, um, Pratt actually, well, Pratt actually did a, um, a plan, fairly contentious, but, but it was, in fact, a master plan for Chinese, for the Chinese groups in Chinatown and on the Lower East Side, different ethnic groups that were part of one sort of um, population. And so 
that does exist. The city, city planning in particular, turned down that plan as a, as a zoning plan. So, so there has been an effort, a fairly recent effort, that actually tried to do that. But you're right. I mean, there, it was the, the 1976 bicentennial plan for Chinatown done by city planning. But that was the last city planning directed Chinatown plan. And in many cities now, that it, they're, not, they're not calling it a comp plan or a comprehensive plan. They're calling it a, a, a comp plan process. Right. Uh, so uh, especially now that we have access to media, uh, one is able to um, tweak plans sort of on the go so that if communities expand or if populations expand or if a, a large number of school children come into a community, one can um, online tweak the plan, a whole community can see the plan, and in some communities you even have plan approval uh, online. Uh, that's different than the old uh, master plan well, or comp plan. Right. That this situation that people are longing for some authority right. to step in and stop all the fighting. Well, that's not going to happen. That's a little beyond the scope of the city planning. Yeah. Uh, the mayor yeah. office has taken over the planning function. We had plan RC and one that's right. Yeah, so that's that right. the plan that we're talking about is now moved to the mayor's office. Except uh, e even the mayor doesn't seem to be able to control, uh, and I'm not talking about any particular mayor, um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but isn't, doesn't seem to be able to control uh, the act, ne necessarily the actions of their agencies or the actions of the uh, council members whose districts these plans are operating in. Even if you have the negotiation beforehand, and we've seen uh, a couple of instances in the upper Manhattan area, even if you cut the deal beforehand, um, when folks come out on the streets and say no, often the councilman says, oh, I didn't realize uh, that this was going to be the, um, uh, the effect. Um, so I still think a uh, entity like city planning, that's a buffer from the mayor. So it's not the mayor's plan, so the mayor can uh, step away from that, uh, can intervene when necessary, is probably the better way to go. And, I, and, and, and I've got to say, even though I think zoning is a tool that everybody should understand and know how to use, you all are young people. Uh, you are supposed to be the advocates and the fighters. So if you believe that we should have planning and not just zoning, I would say don't settle for zoning instead of planning. Doesn't mean in the interim you can't work that zoning thing. Uh, but um, if not you, who? But you've got to change the law. Right. There's yeah. no law that calls for a plan. Can I answer That's the Chinatown issue? Can yes. I answer yes. the Chinatown yes. issue? Let me ask you about, you know, being Chinese American, right? Chinatown is always a very special place, and I think looking at the past, when I was appointed to the Planning Commission, it was a very weak political entity. I don't know if it's still weak. I just learned about the prison uh, issue a few days ago from my other friend, Steve Valentine which I thought is from the plan point of view is ridiculous, trying to get Richard Simons uh, making two, four jails in different uh, uh, things. But I think for China, my suggestion, which may be bold, may not be agreed by the other people, is the planning process in New York is always the vocal voice gets the, is a squeezy wheel gets a breeze. So I think the China people need to really has a lot of noise. And you really, uh, you also need to think about Chinatown being a district rather than being an ethnic uh, the, the area, you know. I mean, the, the, you know, and the other thing is, I've been doing a comprehensive uh, Chinatown plan is very important. At the time, Jeannie and I were doing this, we we're using public college and resources, and I think the mayor Dickens said, "No, I cannot appropriate any funding for that study." So we had to do it with the private school thing. It has never been done. I think you should look at what we have done before, where that's 30 years ago, and maybe rally together some not for profit money to put that thing together. We'd be happy to help. We just want the IMT Foundation uh, hoping to uh, have a higher level of exchanges, but I think th that's what I'm doing now. Okay. It's also empowering the, the, uh, the minorities in New York City, but I'm doing it at the long distance. Okay, so we're ending here. right on time. I just um, want to thank our distinguished panelists for, uh, for coming. <laughs>